It's good to see you today, Dr. Baker. Jake, it's good to see you again, man. Good to see you. Good. I'm interested to hear about your latest. You said you did a little experiment with uh, leaning out. Oh, yeah. I'd say a, a little of an experiment would be an understatement. So I did just about three months of strict carnivore recently. No additions, no anything other than animal-based items in the diet. And for the last 66 days of that, I actually went OMAD. So one meal a day. And then throughout that OMAD, I was actually in a deficit, in a purposefully induced deficit to try and show what I could operate with less, meaning still able able to exercise, still able to perform at work, still able to have tons of energy throughout the day and serve my clients and, and everything else in my life as needed without feeling crazy depletions in energy, lethargy, or otherwise like the normal symptoms that would come with being in such a calorie deficit on a carbohydrate uh, dominated diet. Now the fun part, on day 65 of that, after the strict adherence for nearly three months and 66 days of, of OMAD, I went to have my labs checked to be like, all right, let's get some data to verify the results because I was feeling great. I I had lost total body fat. I had increased lean body muscle. All of my physiological numbers that I could track from home showed significant improvement. And again, my feeling, I would say was my best type of understanding because I felt amazing. I was sleeping amazing. My mood, my mental clarity, everything was great. So then I go to the, get my labs done and the numbers, I must say, kind of scared me. Total cholesterol, 469. That's 469. HDL, 102, LDL 309, triglycerides 206. So first getting those numbers, I was immediately like wide-eyed, even me knowing what little I do know about cholesterol and the debate about its health and, and significance. I started looking around for things and quickly found what's known as lean mass hyper responders. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about and get your thoughts on the lean mass hyper responder theory, its applications towards me, as you and I know through my history together of, of athletics and having already done certain feats as a carnivore, what do you think this means now in what I'm, uh, the current physical condition uh, I'm in? Yeah. I mean, it's a great question. And it's something I see, you know, not, not infrequently with, with people who do going on, you know, low carb, higher fat diets. And so, um, for uh, just a question for you, how, how much weight and body fat did you end up losing during that three month period? I mean, did you actually lose some, some body fat and lean out a little bit? I did. I lost, uh, almost I think it was 15.4 pounds or 16, it was either 15 and a half or 16 and a half pounds over 81 days. And my percent body fat went from seven and a quarter down to four and a half. My wow. lean body mass went from 88 point, I think four up to nine, almost 92%. So my ratios shifted significantly and just the weight reduction itself, I thought was the, the biggest part because I was already in pretty good physical shape. And even people were asking like, where, where, and what weight do you have to lose in the first place? But you know what it's like when you can feel dead weight that you're carrying in the first place and knowing that there was a more optimal physical condition that I could have been in, it made total sense to me. If anything, I was like, I probably still have five more pounds to be able to lose. Well, I mean, 4% body fat is extremely lean. I mean, that's, that's bodybuilding competition stage ready. And so was that, was that measured via Dexa, or how did you measure that? I did it with a digital home scale. So I would give it probably at least okay. a one to one and a half uh, error of fallibility. So if it was telling me I was starting at seven and a quarter, I would say I was probably starting closer to 10. And if yeah. it was saying I was finishing at four and a half, I would say I was probably finishing closer to six. Okay. And that's probably more realistic in my view. But I mean, regardless, there was a definitely downward. I mean, you could look in the mirror and see you were leaner, right? I mean, it wasn't, I mean, that was pretty obvious, it sounds like. Yeah. So, I mean, the lean mass hyper responder is a, is a, as you mentioned, is a theory he first developed by a guy named Dave Feldman, who's an engineer who had a similar sort of situation. He, you know, went on a diet, went on a, on a low carb diet and his cholesterol shot through the roof and but he felt great and got leaner and, and he started really you know looking into this and as an engineer he just dug through the literature and and to his credit he has been uh, uh you know a champion of trying to do objective science on this and not just being you know passionate about it. he's been really really doing that. and so um there is a uh physician a cardio i believe a cardiologist he's been working with and they're looking to publish a paper on that and some of the early data on people just like you with high cholesterol and and you know total cholesterol ldl cholesterol now these the interesting thing is your 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 triglycerides were a little bit high in this particular situation, which usually we see very low triglycerides. So I'm not sure what the deal was with that. Sometimes caffeine can do it. Sometimes you know a, a a fast of a different you know not not adequate length can can lead to that. So I'm not sure why the triglycerides were a little bit high. But you're clearly lean and you're clearly in shape and you're clearly uh, generally devoid of risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease is multi there's multiple risk factors that go into that. And there's you know some folks that would would posit. That 
that, you know, it's more of an inflammatory issue. And as you mentioned, your high, high, high sensitivity C-reactive protein was basically almost zero. So you've got very little inflammation on you. We also know that, you know, during a weight loss phase, there's, there's pretty dynamic shifts in the lipid numbers, you know, um, when we are, according to Dave's theory, this is his lipid energy model. Basically, as we get leaner and leaner, as our cells are relatively low on energy, so to speak, you know, you know what what happens is our liver is in task with providing food to the cells, and so it traffics greater and greater amounts of things like free fatty acids, and with those free fatty acids come the lipoproteins and and the cholesterol. So it's just a matter of energy transfer. And so it's interesting if you look at the data on people that go on fasting, like if you fast for a week. There's studies that show that fasting for a week can raise your LDL cholesterol by, I think, between 30 and 70%. So just not eating. So it's kind of like, well, why would not eating be bad for me if I'm not, you know, if I'm not overeating, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that. So um, the, uh, but I think the real interesting thing is that there was a recent study uh, just, I mean, literally published a couple of weeks ago, looking at this very phenomenon. Um, and it, remind me, did you have a zero coronary artery calcium scan or did you do that? I can't remember if you did or not. I didn't get it done. I got the CRP, the full panel labs and my tests. And I'm still waiting back for the test scores to come. And, and how old are you? 38 right now. 38. Okay. So um, we do know there was a large, large trial done in Denmark last year. And it's part, I think it's part of this so-called MESA trial, the multi-ethnicity study on atherosclerosis. And what they, sh what they just showed is that if you don't have active cardiovascular disease, and they assess this through something called a coronary artery calcium scan. So if you have no evidence of calcified plaque in your arteries, your LDL cholesterol made no difference on progression to cardiac events. I mean, it was like, it was like irrelevant. So what it, what it seems to indicate, at least based on that study and some other similar studies is that LDL cholesterol starts to becoming a dependent variable. That is to say, if your LDL is high, you know, it could be a problem. It could be a big problem, particularly if you have all the other variables in place. If you have underlying vascular damage from, say, things like smoking or hypertension or hyperglycemia or some chronic inflammatory disease, you know, rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or something like that. So if you've got this underlying damaged vasculature, and you have high LDL cholesterol, and perhaps the LDL cholesterol has become oxidized for some reason, maybe through hyperglycemia or some other oxidative stress, then that combination could set you up for, you know, increased in cardiovascular disease. So I don't tell people to ignore this. I mean, you shouldn't ignore a high LDL cholesterol. Uh, but if you have, um, you know, everything else looking good, which, which sounds like in you in general is, you know, low C-reactor protein, low body fat, I assume very good, you know, cardiovascular function, you just got done running a very fast marathon. So you're in shape. So those things to me all point to, um, you know, you may fall into this group that doesn't have cardiovascular disease, whereas LDL cholesterol may not be as a big of a concern as it would be for someone who's sedentary, you know, maybe they're pre-diabetic, maybe they got a little bit too much body fat. Those people clearly, you know, could benefit from well, a general lifestyle improvement across the board and, and including, you know, maybe while they're still in this fat state, you know, overfed sedentary state, maybe they need to work on reducing the LDL cholesterol. Um, and so we don't know for sure. I mean, I can't just say totally ignore it. It's no, no issue. How I would approach it if it was me, I would start looking at, you know, imaging studies because there's a difference between risk factors and actually having disease or not having disease. And so you can say, okay, I've got this theoretical risk factor, but is it actually a risk factor in my particular situation? Is it actually a risk factor for me or is that just a general population? And that's where we have to individualize, you know, who we're dealing with, you know, you know, if you gave a blanket recommendation across the entire population in the United States, knowing that the majority of people are generally metabolically unhealthy, that's generally probably a good recommendation. But when you start looking at individuals and you say, Hey, you don't have any of those other risk factors and maybe that LDL cholesterol for you is fine. Um, you know, and maybe it isn't, I mean, I don't know. I, I can't say definitively, but what I would say, you get more information. So you start getting some sort of imaging, you know, now typically the coronary calcium scan, most people don't recommend, recommend it before age 40. Um, you know, maybe because you've got this dramatically elevated LDL cholesterol, somebody said, well, maybe it might be worth doing that early because even, even in the AHA guidelines, the American Heart Association guidelines, they talk about de-risking, you know, so you have somebody that, you know, 450, 450 plus L, uh, total cholesterol is definitely considered a high risk, but can you be, de can you be de-risked based on other factors? And I think the answer is, yeah, potentially. So that's, 
that's how I would approach this type of situation. And I think um, it's good that you have that information. It can be instructive for other people that find themselves in similar situation because it doesn't make sense to me just on a, on a very basic empirical level that I've done everything that has generally made me so much healthier. I'm fit. I'm in shape. I can run a marathon. I'm lean. Uh, I'm strong. Everything feels great. Uh, I assume you have normal blood pressure and all these things. And I've got one lab marker that is just doesn't line up with all this other stuff. Is that lab marker an, an outlier or is it like by running marathons and eating, you know, losing body fat, have I made myself unhealthy? It doesn't make sense to me, you know, just from a, just a basic common sense standpoint. And I think that, you know, as we realize that, a lot, you know, and I, you know, and this is a sad part, you know, a lot of the data that we have on medical conditions and treatment and things like that are produced by pharmaceutical companies who have been not the most transparent and have been unethical. And, and some of that makes it into its research. And so, again, I would get some imaging, a CAC scan, maybe a carotid Doppler study where they do an ultrasound in your neck and they can say, hey, how much how much plaque is, is between is, is in there? Maybe there's zero, probably there's zero. And that can give you at least some level of comfort. And then you can repeat that periodically to say, um, you know, um, you know, am I comfortable with that high level of LDL cholesterol? I can speak for myself. Now, I haven't had LDL cholesterol that I'm, the highest I've seen mine has been 300, but it usually runs, you know, in the low to mid 200, sometimes even occasionally below 200. I don't really worry too much about that. It's not, you know, I'm not trying to shoot for, you know, an LDL cholesterol below 100, like some people would have you say. I don't, it doesn't bother me to run higher than that, but I know myself. I mean, I, I, I'm very, you know, very well versed in what I, what I can do. And I, you know, I can see as a 56 year old man, I'm performing cardiovascularly as good as better as I was in my, my forties and thirties even. So I'm like, that exactly. doesn't sort of lend itself to fluoride cortic coronary artery disease or cardiovascular disease. It just doesn't make sense. Um, and so, and I've had, a, you know, I've had a coronary artery calcium scan. Mine was a perfect zero. So I would again, fall into that cohort where I've got a zero coronary artery calcium scan. Sometimes my LDL is high, you know, at least according to, to some of these studies, it, it probably doesn't matter in that case, as long as you know, my blood pressure is good and my glycemic control is good and, and, you know, my inflammation numbers are good, you know, so that's kind of an overview. It's great. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot there. And, and I, uh, you know, my last blood pressure, uh, or the vitals was 120 over 80. So that was another thing to, I said, okay, another, you know, piece that's not adding up to the rest. Uh, I used various, uh, risk factor calculators and inputted the numbers to the best that I could. Some of those calculators max out at certain numbers. So right. I used the ratios, which I currently have, and inputted those into about six, five or six different calculators. And the ratios still came out showing less than 1% risk. So even though the numbers, I wasn't able to put 469 or 309 for certain elements, a la the total or the HDL, right. I put whatever the maximum yeah. allowance was for each and then used the same uh, percentage uh, degradation model and got, like I said, less than 1% risk. So yeah, because your, your total, your total to HDL ratio is under five. It's like four or something like that, which is can still considered reasonable. So <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there's, like I said, there's a lot of these risk calculators that, that, that are multifactorial and, and whenever you, and it's always better, I think in my view, to use something that, that, that accounts for a lot of things. And um, so, yeah, and then it just says your risk factor for cardiovascular disease is less than 1%. You're not going to get much better than that. And, you, you know, it's funny. You can play with those calculators and say, well, what if this number was this? What if I got my LDL cholesterol? What if I got my total <laughs> cholesterol down to 190? Well, then the difference is like 0.2%, right? right? Does, is it worth it to me? Is it worth it to me to change my lifestyle and perhaps get fatter and perhaps have more inflammation and perhaps have sore, achy knees or, you know, whatever, whatever. You know, it's kind of one of those things you just have to sort of consider your quality of life versus your quantity of life. And, and, you know, like I said, if it's 0.2% different for me or less than 1% different for me, I'm like, man, is it even worth it? I don't know. Agreed. And, uh, to your question about caffeine, I've also been caffeine free for that entire time. So it wasn't caffeine, uh, that could have, you know, unless there was some type of latency, but I was having milk, raw milk pretty much every day, a glass, if not two uh, on mm -hmm. some days, but even still like that shouldn't have been enough to push the triglycerides in mind opinion. Or well, I mean, the one thing I, I think the one thing to be mindful of, and I've just, I've, you know, I've kind of, you know, reached this conclusion that, that, you know, if you're eating, like, if you just pound like a big old steak, 20 ounce steak, you know, in the evening, you're probably still not fasting by the morning. 
you know, by 7 a.m., you're, you're not actually fasting because that food is still actively being digested and still being absorbed. So that's not really a truly fasting number. So I think in many cases, you might need a full 24 hours of fasting um, to, to actually get a true fasting number in, in, in some of those cases. So just depending on like when I when I sit down there and crush three pounds of steak in one setting, I mean, there's a reason I'm not hungry for 16, eight hours because I'm right. not even digesting right. it yet. Right. 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 So it's like, I'm still getting nutrition from that meal. And so if you're still getting nutrition, you may not actually be fasted. Well, that's probably uh, a good point then, because I had my breakfast that day at uh, like zero three, zero three thirty, and had the labs done right around noon or 1300. I forget. Yeah. Well, so, then you're, that wasn't even a fasting number. I mean, that's not even a fasting triglyceride. So go in there, you know, 16 hours between, you know, your last meal and get it, get your and triglycerides are probably going to be 50. I mean, I, I they were 39 last time I got them. Right, so when, right. I, when so I saw that number, yeah. I was like, that can't right. be, something can't be right here. You know? Well, it wasn't a, it wasn't a fasted number. So if it's, if they're traditionally running, you know, 39, my God, yeah, you're definitely this lean mass hyper responder phenotype that Dave talks about. So, um, and his study, I mean, so just because I don't know if I mentioned this. So the study he's working on, you know, basically what he's, he's taking people just like you with super high cholesterol, they're lean and fit and everything else looks good. They've been doing invasive cardiovascular imaging, you know, cap, you know, uh, court, you know uh, dye contrast CT angiography. And what they've shown is I think with four up to four years of data, I, thought, I may be wrong on this, but I believe it was four year intermediate data that there was no increased risk for cardiovascular. In fact, they were, they were lower than the average population, mm. which makes sense to me. Yeah, so yeah. The study has not been published yet. So he released some of the preliminary data, some of the, you know, kind of the midway point data. So I think next year, maybe that study will come out and, and we'll have, uh, you know, people that are like you, because anytime there's a study that's out there and says, well, this, this shows this and this number one, you have to ask, you have to ask yourself, the biggest question is, does that study population represent me? Is it me or is it someone else? Exactly. If there's a study on, you know, fat 60 year old females and you're a, a lean 38 year old dude. It's like, well, I'm not in that. That's not my group. So you gotta, you gotta say, does the study actually represent the cohort that I'm actually in? If it's not, then you can kind of disregard that for the most part. And then, it, you know, and then it's like, you know, what was the outcome they're measuring? You know, do, is it relevant to me? What are the other situations? Am I in a totally different situation? So, so yeah, it's uh, it, it, so like I said, you would fall into that lean mass hyper responder category, I think quite easily. And, you know, like I said, we'll know more in a year or so when that study is actually published. And I'm sure it'll be, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people that hate it. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's you know, because you're, you're kind of fighting against a narrative in a business model. I mean, it, right. just as much as you think it's pure science, it's not. There's a lot of, because there's people still promoting crap from the 1980s. Some of the science has been so out of date, but they still like the business model. Yep, and, yep, yep. And, and, you know, and, and most the average person just doesn't have, just doesn't have the, uh, the interest or the ability to, you know, understand what's going on in the new some some of the newer stuff. So it's uh, you know, but it's interesting. People like your, yourself and, and mine, and me and others that are pushing the envelope and saying, hey, let's let's challenge these things. Let's challenge these assumptions and see what happens. By if we would listen to what the assumptions are, I should be dead. You shouldn't be doing what you're doing. I mean, we should you know. So so why are I should we doing be having that? open heart surgery like my father did at 37 right, years right, old? Right, right, right. So I should be too. And I mean, I'm like, because I'm eating. You know, I'm eating. You know, the average American's eating two and a half ounces of red meat a day. I'm eating. 20 times that much, right. literally 20 times that much, Same. something is supposed to be bad for you. And yet here I am thriving. Why is that? You know, maybe, maybe the information we've been told is problematic. Maybe the fact that we eat two and a half ounces of, of, of beef a day as Americans, but we eat 60% of our diet comes from ultra processed, refined, refined food, carbohydrates, refined, grains, refined carbohydrates, seed oils, and sugar. And that's 60% of the diet. Maybe that's the problem. I mean, crazy right. as it sounds, right? Well, I appreciate the time today, Dr. Baker. Um, Glad to talk about. It. I know it's a hot topic and highly debatable, and I yeah. will go get fresh fasted labs taken so we can have accurate data to sample from, and I'll get some imaging and graph work done as well. And we'll awesome. come back and do it again. Thanks, Jake. All right, man. All right, I got to always good to see you. All right, bye bye.